You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Good day, everybody. This is Global Trade This Week. My name is Doug Draper. On the other side of the coast is my good friend Pete Mento, and we are stoked about this uh, about this week's episode. We delayed it one day because of a hot topic that everybody's been talking about. Um, and we're going to have a one topic show. We're still going to have halftime. Don't worry about that. But uh, this is too important to, uh, to pass by. So, Pete, here's my question to you. When is this strike going to end? Doug, you had to do it. Uh, I have answered that question two dozen times maybe today. And I've answered it the same way every time. We have no idea. I think the only people who have an idea would be the senior leadership in the union who knows how long they're willing to hold out before they'll drop this and the carriers who have an idea of just how much they're willing to give away before it blows up in their face. I mean, this is, this is the fall of our discontent, man. Like how many times have we talked about this topic on the show? How many times? I don't know. How many times has this come up on the show? Guys, there's a, there's, there's probably going to be a strike. There's a good chance of a strike. Hope it's not a strategy. Do something, do something. And there were like two types of customers. There are the ones that I've been dealing with mostly, which is uh, they did nothing. They did nothing. Or they're the, the ones that, as you brought up a number of times, they saw something was a possibility, so they've overstocked. And that was like my first question, Doug, is are warehouses full from you know people just buying a bunch of stuff ahead of the, the problem? Yeah. They, um, yes. I mean, it's not COVID full, right? When, every, when everybody pivoted from a uh, con- you know, a goods environment to a services environment and, and the supply chain didn't pivot. So it's not at that level, but um, yeah, they're starting to get pretty full and they are going to be more full. The interesting thing about this, Pete, and this is not strike related, so we'll get back to that. But um, because of the shortened week, I made a post about this uh, maybe a week ago that the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas this, this year is one week shorter. So you got four weeks to get all your crap done instead of five weeks. Um, and all the retailers uh, realize that. So they're pushing the, hey, we need the stuff in-house into our DCs to make it on the shelf by like mid-October. I think Amazon said the 19th of October. Don't hold me to that date. So my point is that's been bringing product in um, to fill up warehouses. And this will certainly uh, throw things for a loop. But it's not COVID crazy, but um, it could depend on how long the strike goes. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm full of rage today, Doug. I think that's the best way to put it. Watching, watching the news, which I don't know why I do it, because when they bring up a topic that I actually know about and they're so clearly uneducated on it, it turns me into just a cranky old man. Like, uh, what if Christmas has to be canceled now because nothing's in the country? Bro, that stuff was already on its way here. All the toys are already here. They're already in warehouses. This is not as big a deal as you think it is as far as that's concerned. It's after all of that. Mm-hmm. It's that period of time between now and, say, January, when we're trying to recover from another supply chain crunch. That's where it's miserable. You know, I had a friend of mine today. He's a harbor pilot. He sent me a text and he said, uh, you know, automation's bad, Pete, because when I go to the port to get on the pilot boat to go meet a ship, it just makes me a lot happier that I have a person making a quarter of a million dollars a year to check my ID personally rather than just going through a machine and having it done that way. You know, um, you go to a port in China, you go to a port in, um, in Japan, you bring your credentials, they scan it. And then there's one person for every entry or two people for every entry who are reviewing it. And if there's a problem, then they send a person. The, the amount of automation in every other port in the world is staggering compared to this. And I get my backup buddy, just get my backup thinking that in order to maintain these jobs, which I believe in, in unions, I do. I believe in unions. I believe in, in unionized labor. But damn it, Doug, you're slowing down international commerce. You're slowing it down. And every other industry in the world has had to come to grips with the fact it's 2024. This one just doesn't seem to want to. Yeah. Yeah, this morning on <clears throat> NPR, I don't remember the individual that was being interviewed, but they but he made a comment. And this is a valid comment, right? Uh, certainly if you're on the striking side is that robots don't pay taxes and robots don't um, buy products, right? 
And I kind of chuckle the fact that he said the word robots, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that all technology is, uh, is robots, but that is a valid point. You know, that's a valid point. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a hard line between what you just said, supporting jobs, people, livelihoods, and uh, moving in to match what's going on in the rest of the world related to technology. So, it's, uh, You know what robots do, Doug? Let me tell you what robots do. Robots create export jobs for American manufacturing employees. Robots create opportunities for people to work on the robots. Robots create an incredible opportunity for us to expand our technological base. Robots will pick up for the fact there aren't enough human beings anymore. And America leads the world in robotics technology. It's us, Japan, and China. We, we blow everybody else away. So maybe this is another one of those places where what's good for the bee is good for the hive. And we do what's right for our economy, like when we stop making blue jeans in New York City. Yeah, yeah. So um, just a 30,000-foot view, right? So um, here's the, the deal, right? The management has offered a 40% wage increase over six years. And the uh, ILA says, no, we want 61.5. Now, hmm. for a period of time leading up to this, they didn't really say the specific amount. People were speculating 77%, but it was called out today to 61.5% wage increase. And like you said, halt all automation at the ports, which um, is uh, an interesting topic that we've already covered. So that's the premise behind it. It's pretty small. It's money. Money and robots. Well, I think 61, what did you say? 61.5%? Is that what it was? Six, that, that's what I had read this morning, yes. I wonder if that was some you know, consultant who told them that's the number, or if they just said, let's make it arbitrary, let's make it something weird, but let's put a one and a half percent in there. So if they drop it to 60, they feel like they won, you know, I, it just seems like such a weird number to go from, but the, yeah. the amount of money that, so back in the day, a long, long time ago, the longshoremen unions, there was a law about how many longshoremen had to be in every hold. I believe it was 28 people and that allowed them to perpetuate this. And then as container ships came, they had to back off on that. You didn't need that many people in it. You know, mm -hmm. the most people you're going to see work in a hole, there's six to eight people. That's about it. And they found other jobs to do. These unions do have no-show jobs. They have jobs where people are waiting to be called on in case someone's injured or hurt or sick or can't come in. And the upper echelon of people that work for them are making a ridiculous amount of money. At the lower end, longshoring is hard work. There's no two ways about it. Making sure that containers are properly lashed to the vessel, managing the mafias, you know, driving containers from one place to another, uh, working the crane. Working a crane is an incredible skill. So all of these things are skilled labor and they deserve to be rewarded. However, you're holding up global trade. If we were able to use more automation, great. Now here's the counter argument to that. I never thought of until someone said it to me today. In a world where we're terrified of cybersecurity, having human beings able to do most of this must be great. I pointed out to them that all the cranes and everything else are networked. So you can, unless you can get a bunch of longshoremen to pick a container up and heft it off the ship, that's really not going to help you much. Uh, but Doug, it's name another industry that has not managed to become more efficient and better because of automation. Name one. Uh, right off the top of my head, I can't. I cannot. Yeah. Right. We, we've talked about how disconnected. This industry is in the digital freight brokers and how they have this overlaid technology. But the bottom line, it's still humans that are uh, pushing the buttons and flipping the levers. I think I said that right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, our industry, trucking, rail, parcel, um, ports, it's a lot of people. You need people to get the job done. So. You know, and speaking of people, Doug, we have to worry about a sympathy strike from the West Coast. And that, that would just shut America down to imports. Yeah. So, I, until you uh, had brought that up a few minutes ago, I had not, I had not thought about that. I know that the, the Teamsters are fully supportive, right? So, oh, yeah. um, so that's problematic with, yeah. uh, I don't know if it's problematic, but that brings UPS potentially into the situation. Um, and DHL and, too, I think. I think they're unionized too. Yeah. I, I didn't, Pete, here's the bottom line. I didn't think this was going to happen. And the reason, yeah. who, who knew what was going on, but with the, the hurricane, Helene that just came through and the destruction that that um, created specifically inland where people, you wouldn't think a hurricane there, but it just blasted up through the curve. There's some name for the curvature there in, in uh, Florida. 
But um, yeah, the devastation there is is horrific, and there's a lot of brother in arms with the type of uh, folks that are driving trucks and and lumping containers, so to speak. So uh, I truly didn't think this was going to go down because of that. Like the final um, the final hours, they're like, we can't do this to the U.S. economy. But maybe that was the straw that broke the camel's back to make it a strike to get what the, to get what uh, what they want. So the I think both of us didn't think it would happen because there'd be some kind of intervention, you know, but the, the white house, I don't know if you saw Ramondo's comments yesterday, the secretary of commerce, I haven't really been paying attention to this issue. I'd like to refer you to the white house. Yeah. You are I've heard white that. House. You are the white <laughs> house. And then Pete Buttigieg, you know, he's the one who'd have to pull the trigger on the, what is it? The heart, the Taft Hartley act, Hartley Taft act. I can't remember what it's called. That would force these folks to have a 90 day cool down period, renegotiate, get back to work. Doing that right now would be political suicide because that would mean that the Democratic Party told these folks to go back to work and that would absolutely cost them votes. And oh. you don't want to have people that are sympathetic to the labor movement seeing, you know, seeing someone come out there from the White House and saying, get back to work. It would not do well for them with regards to voting. And if you yeah. think for a minute that a union president saying, we're not going to vote, don't vote, wouldn't, wouldn't happen, wouldn't have an impact. I think you're wrong. You know, these are folks that are voting like most of us do. They're voting on the pocketbook and they're voting on how things impact them. And if they feel like they're not being supported, they can't be dependent upon to show up at the ballots and vote for the quote unquote right party for, for, the, uh, for the union. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the ex uh, extenuating circumstances or external circumstances that all play in, in part of this. Right. And just thinking right now in the moment on this show, you have Helene, which came through, there's leverage. I mean, this sounds horrible yeah. because of the destruction and, and the despair that's going on in those markets. There's some leverage, which makes this more dire. Um, and then the whole, um, the election coming up and it's a tricky situation to mandate or support, um, or whatever needs to be done. But those are ex uh, external forces that uh, came into play, which may have predicated and, 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 and created um, the reason for the strike. So it's, it's crazy. Um, hey, I want to do a quick halftime, and then I want to come back and talk about some of the commodities that could be impacted. And then what you just said at the beginning is, yeah, you can turn the ports back on, but holy cow, is there going to be a ripple effect, right? So uh, let's come back on the second half and, and tackle that one. So sure. um, I'll say halftime brought to you by Cap Logistics, right? That's when we get to talk about whatever we want um, yeah. and uh, enjoy it and just have some fun. So Pete, tell me what you got going on for this week's halftime. I got two. So the first is I want to give a massive shout out to both the Journal of Commerce, Peter Tershwell's team as well as G-Captain for the coverage that they've done on this particular topic. They've been, uh, they've been ahead of everything. They've scooped yeah. some stuff and they've been very good at, in a meticulous, thoughtful way, putting out their things without being inflammatory or, or trying to cause too much fear. So both of them, excellent publications. If you don't follow them on your social medias, you probably ought to start. Uh, if you don't have a subscription, to both, you should probably get one. So both excellent. And then the second one I wanted to bring up, it is the spooky season, officially done. Yeah. Apparently we can't call it Halloween anymore. Um, that has some sort of context that bothers people, whatever. Uh, but it is the spooky season, Doug, which means that you're going to be inundated with everything Halloween. And I'm wondering, Doug, um, where, well, you can answer this in a moment. You know, I was not a horror movie kid. That wasn't my thing when I was younger. And I was constantly being drugged to drag to these, uh, drugged, that's funny, dragged yeah, to sure horror were. movies when I was a kid with all my buddies. You know, my buddies would get together when the new movies would come out and we'd go see them together. And I would not admit to the fact that I was in abject terror while I was watching these things. Uh, but I do have a couple that I really liked. So I'm wondering, Doug, what your favorite um, scary movies are, or if you watch scary movies at all. You know, I have not watched scary movies in, in quite a long time. Um, but as far as ones in the past, right, I think I, I think we mentioned this on a couple of shows ago, but Poltergeist, the original, not the remake, scared me to death, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you watch it now, it's pretty lame, I guess. But uh, Carrie Ann, I think was that kid's name. 
And uh, man, that that show freaked me out. And then obviously Freddy Krueger, the, the very first one, that, that was a whole nother level of horror movies. But I'd say Freddy Krueger, not so much the whole series, but the first one. And then Poltergeist, for sure, freaked me out. Yeah, those are both excellent. You? My, daughter, my daughter and her friends watch what they call classic 80s horror films, which makes me feel so old. And they, they don't think they're scary because they grew up with like Saw and you know, all these real scary ones. But for me, my, the two that really messed with my head were the Amityville horror. I was far too young to have seen that movie. Uh, and the exorcist, those were two that really got to me when I was a kid. And then the remake of the exorcist, any kind of religious horror, because, you know, I am a church going person. They really get to me. So, um, you know, the omen that one got to me as well. But as far as modern ones go, I really like seven. Um, with mm-hmm. with Brad Pitt, I thought that was just an excellent movie. But yeah, yeah, yeah those are the ones for me, Doug. What do you got? Amityville. So this one is uh, something that uh, you and I are both familiar with, and I wanted to make sure that our audience was aware. So World Trade Center Denver, they've been a, a great supporter of both of our careers and helped us uh, with educational um, events over the years. And I just have a lot of respect for Karen and uh, and that organization out there. So. They are actually having an event that I felt it was uh, relative enough that I wanted to share with it. So on October 8th, right, from noon to one o'clock, so it's one hour, that's mountain time, they're having a a very uh, interesting webinar called The Future of Trade and Foreign Policy in 2025. So it's free. It's a webinar. It's over lunch, at least here in in the mountain time zone. And it's going to be a panel. Uh, I think there's four speakers and then uh, four panelists and then a uh, a moderator. And you can learn more about the um, the event uh, going to WTCDenver.com or there's going to be a lot of LinkedIn posts that you may have seen already. And so I want to give a shout out. They always bring unique perspectives and the, the speakers that they have on here are, are, uh, are a, good, um, uh, a good group that will have uh, uh, interesting perspectives on things. And then the last piece on this, Pete, is that I have always been a huge fan. World Trade Center redid their website and kind of remarketed and rebranded themselves. I was going to say a couple of years ago, but I think it was pre-COVID. So, you know, what is that, five years ago? Um, and I love the th- I love it because it, their, their tagline, if you go to their website, says, from these mountains, you can see the world. And so it loops in Colorado and international trade. And I think that is just a perfect statement. And so from these mountains, Pete, here in Colorado, you can see the world. And I would encourage everybody on the 8th of October, 12 to 1 Mountain Time, uh, check out this webinar related to future of trade and foreign policy for next year. Yeah, a uh, huge shout out to Karen Gerwitz and her team at WTC Denver. I, I can't uh, thank them enough for all the support that they've given me, given you. I mean, I think if it weren't for Karen, you and I wouldn't be doing the show, honestly. Yeah. She kind of got us together. And anytime I've ever needed any support, any of the World Trade Centers have always been there. Denver in particular has been incredibly helpful. Um, I don't know how many times I've spoken at WTC events around the country. They really do live their mission. They really are out there trying to help. And if you're an importer or an exporter, or you're involved in our business at all, and you're not a member of your local WTC, you need to get off the get off your duff and go do something about it. They're absolutely the right types of people to have around you. Yeah, for sure. Good. All right. Same topic on uh, the second half of the show. So um, back to the strike that we are in the thick of. So Pete, I want to jump in first and just kind of give you a couple of thoughts here. Um, As far as commodities and things are going to be affected, right? There is a lot of food and beverages that come over and hit the East Coast ports. You think of all the European um, unique I can't think of the right word, but, you know, we're not shipping in uh, uh, mac and cheese, right? There's a lot of, uh, of interesting foods that come over. So food and beverage are going to be impacted up, up in, uh, in New York and down like Savannah and uh, the, the Gulf or the, uh, uh, the ports in Savannah and Georgia. Dole Pineapple and Chiquita Bananas, right? Those are their main ports of call. They hit it a couple times a week each. And I think that... Um, uh, you're going to see an impact in the grocery store because of all the perishables. Um, there is um, quite a bit of um, vaccines 
Did I come in? I didn't realize that. I was looking at that this morning. Um, and so there's some cars which are important, right? That's kind of a first world problem with not being able to buy the new car. But I think the, the food's going to have an impact, uh, vaccines and some medical supplies. And when you go to a grocery store, Pete, and you don't see things on the shelf, that just kind of creates a little bit of a panic, right? That's you saw the toilet paper situation during COVID. And um, I heard on the radio here in Colorado that you can judge um, the state of the economy by looking at the banana area of a grocery store. If there's no bananas, then there could be problems. So I, I think the food may create a little bit of a, of a panic. Uh, and then the vaccines and the medical piece uh, could be going on. The last thing I'll say to this, Pete, and I'll get your read on it, is that here's the cool thing is uh, the ILA said that if there's any military cargo will not be effective. So uh, they'll take care of our military if there's things that need to be transported uh, in that capacity. And I didn't realize this, but tankers and uh, LNG, liquid um, natural gas, they go to different ports. And even though they go to different ports, they're not going to be affected, as well as bulk commodities, grains and stuff like that. So not 100% of things are shut down. Um, so I wanted to call those two things out. But what, what's your read? What are you hearing about with commodities that could have a ripple effect? So the the petroleum one's very important, right? So you're going to have raw crude coming in. Where, where you've got a problem, though, are the chemicals necessary for distillation processes. All those folks that are doing the refining, the chemicals that we use for that, those come in through those ports. So yes, we probably will have what we need as far as you know crude oil goes. But being able to refine it could absolutely be impacted. The banana one is one that really, I'll never forget, I used to you know work on the ships in the port in Delaware when they would come in, when I was doing marine surveying to make money on the side. And the fact that we just don't really grow bananas in this country, you know, you'd see plums and pears and peaches and everything come in on those fruit chips and then go into cold storage there and in Savannah, that will be impacted. Uh, I think also we should spend a little time understanding the automotive industry, parts. If you're looking for parts, there's going to end up being a gap now from when parts were coming in via ocean. So getting repairs done to your car will be impacted. And, uh, and everything else from that, I'm not so deeply concerned. Um, but I, I, I am, the longer this goes, the scarier it's going to be on the recovery, particularly in parts of our world, like uh, building construction, parts for buildings, chemicals is a huge one. And then anything associated with pharmaceuticals and medical devices. It's a yeah. mess, up. It's a mess. <clears throat> and the, the uh, last, last thing I have on this one is that, you know, it's a supply chain and it rolls down. So, yeah, there'll be a big news blurb whenever it uh, gets resolved and the ports are back to normal and we go about our daily life. But what about the trucks that are backed up? What about the the product that is uh, that can't get to the final mile? And oh, by the way, there's a, a catastrophic hurricane that just hit a significant area of, of that. So just because the ports are open doesn't mean everything's back to normal. Like you said, it's a ripple effect that could last weeks. Right. And so if you're in the uh, um, you know end of October and you're wondering why there's no bananas or why it takes a week to get your car fixed, um, all of those are going to have uh, implications, and it could be leveraged with the um, the election this year as well. So it ain't over just because the ports open up doesn't mean the situation is resolved. It's going to go on for weeks after things open up, let alone until they resolve the issue. Yeah, I mean, think about what the cost is going to end up being on on this and then the ripple effect of the availability of equipment if all the containers are here they're not over there to get stuff and there's going to be a lag of getting equipment back over there and i think capacity is going to be harmed as well as there's a backlog of manufactured products that have to come here whenever you have those two things prices go up uh, yeah last point then i'll let you kind of close the show out with your comments i just read literally uh 30 minutes before our show time here is that um Maersk uh, said that it would introduce a port disruption surcharge on all cargo moving to and from the U.S. East Coast and Gulf ports, beginning on the 21st of October, anywhere between $1,500 and $3,700. So uh, I just thought that is like, hey, they're going to get their money and they're going to take care of themselves, right? So you have a strike, we'll implement a uh, port disruption surcharge. So I, I thought that was just icing on the cake. Yeah. Never let a crisis go to waste, Doug. You know, I, I say it all the time. Don't hate the player, hate the game. 
They've mm-hmm. created an environment where they can find ways to profit from chaos. And that's a huge part of our business overall. When things are crazy and you need help, that's when folks in the middle or the folks that control the rails, they make the money, buddy. You're, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, uh, it's not just going to be them. You know, if they're successful with it, it'll be everybody else. And oh, for sure. we don't make yeah. more money on that. It's just one more thing of cost we have to pass on to someone else. It's not a financial opportunity for middlemen. It's financial opportunity for the folks in on the rails. Yeah. yeah. Good deal. Well, with that, Doug, I know that um, I don't think we've ever done one topic for the entire show. No, so that's we haven't. And we even managed to get a good halftime in there. But, uh, you know, thanks as always to the good people at Cap Logistics for just their continued unwavering support of the show. Thanks to all of you that take time out of your week to listen to us, send us questions, reach out to us on social media. Thanks to uh, Keenan, who we have yet to mention and I have yet to vilify on this podcast. So uh, whatever, Keenan. And um, <laughs> thanks to you, Doug, as always, my, my intrepid uh, partner on the show. And if it happens in Global Trade next week, we'll be talking about it on Global Trade this week. Have a great week, pal. All right. You too, buddy. Take care.